There's not a whole lot here. I mean, it's always a lot in the Word of God. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us here today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And if you're in the neighborhood, come on by and join us at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. We sure did. Oh, Patty, we missed you. You missed a great virtual reality. I'm rubbing it in here a little bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was so good. The fellowship was good, having all the people here. Uh, over, I think it was a little over 50 to 60 people. Uh, fellowshipping, eating, and then watching the uh, virtual reality uh, movie. It was, it was awesome. It was really awesome. So we had a great time this weekend. I hope you did too. Let's go ahead and pray and we'll get into God's word. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for getting us up this morning, Lord, and being so faithful to us, Lord God. And thank you for such a wonderful weekend, Lord. To end the weekend, Lord, as we gather together as a church, a body of Christ, and just fellowshiped, watch a movie about Jesus' life, all the way to his ascension into heaven, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that that movie has impacted us greatly, Lord, and a reminder to us, Father, of what Jesus has done for us, Lord. And so minister to us now, Lord, as God has established a church within every community that we should attend, that we should support, and we should serve in. And so, Lord, minister to us this truth because so many believers, Lord, are falling away from this truth, Father, thinking that they can be uh, having church in their home or with another brother somewhere else, Lord, and that is far from the truth, Lord. And so, Lord, let us uh, see the evidence that you give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning again. Let's see here. Good morning, Patty. Yeah, get the app. I think you'll love it. So we're in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to look at the qualifications of a bishop or an elder or a pastor. And then also uh, Paul's going to charge how we ought to behave in the church itself. And then he'll close up with a couple of explanations, expla explanations of the Lord. So let's uh, get into uh, the qualifications of an elder. I'm not going to be able to define every one of these words. I mean, this, this would take quite a while to go through a study here. So you'll just have to uh, get what he's saying. And he's really looking at the character of the man here as he teaches um, how to find an elder. And by the way, if God wanted us to just fellowship at home in our pajamas while we watch a screen, there would be no need for elders, right? right. Yeah. Why have elders in the church? Because they're not coming to your home, <laughs> and they're not a part of your home. You know, elders are for churches because there's groups of people there, and they help with the work that's being done. So elders are not raised up to stay home and be in their own little house. So uh, see that very clearly. I hope you see that. Also, all these epistle letters that are written in the New Testament, all written to churches. These are buildings that house God's people. So that's another evidence. And then Paul here at the end is going to talk about how we should conduct ourselves in church. And so, again, more evidence that you should be a part of a body of Christ. And you're connected there. You're under their authority and leadership, and you support them. And I don't think you ought to be jumping from church to church. I don't think you should be going from place to place. I think you should be asking God, where does God want me? And then be faithful to that place, you know, until the Lord takes you home or until he personally really moves you to go to another place. And I also really believe that you should go to a church that's in your own community. I really do. There, there's a lot of reasons that I believe that. Because, um, one, uh, your accountability. People know you in the community. They'll know you're a Christian. Uh, and it keeps you accountable to behave correctly and have good character within your own community. Uh, two, it's close by. And so uh, you're, you have easy access. Uh, you can get there quickly. Um, it's not far away. Uh, you can participate in events and so forth. And so there's just, just a lot of pluses for that than traveling, you know, 50 miles away or 25 or 20, 30 minutes to get to a church when within your own community there's a Calvary Chapel, sometimes two within your own community. So let's go ahead and, and run through these qualifications of a bishop. 
This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of bishop, he desires a good work. So first, a man has to desire to be a bishop, to be a pastor, to be an elder. It, it, it comes from God within his heart. Lord, I would love to be used in that capacity, to be able to minister to people and see people uh, um, change, see people grow, see people mature in the faith. I mean, that's always an exciting thing for leadership. When they see a babe in Christ come to know Jesus Christ and then their faith grows because they're reading the Bible, they're going through trials, they're going through struggles, but they're trusting God and then seeing their life change for the better and then getting involved in ministry. I saw that with uh, our young worship leader, Jesse. He was in high school when he started here. And he was a part of the youth group when he started here. And people in ministry poured into him and poured into him and, and then said, hey, let's try worship. Go out for worship. He didn't even know that he wanted to do worship. Just they did, had a worship class, played the guitar. He wanted to learn to play the guitar. He played the guitar. And next thing you know, he's starting to sing. And they're like, wow, you can actually sing. you know. And look at what God is doing through him today. And it's just so exciting to see God grow people in that direction. So to have a desire to be a bishop is a good thing, but you also need all of these qualifications. Look at verse two. A bishop then must be blameless, blameless. In other words, he has to be irreproachable. <coughs> has to be irreproachable. It has to have character, integrity, that when someone approaches him, you know, no, that's not right. If they're accusing him, you go, no, that's not who he is. I know him well enough that he's blameless. The husband of one wife, temperate. Temperate there means um, abstaining from wine. So he knows how to control himself. He's temperate. He tempers himself over these things. They don't control him. Sober-minded, uh, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. So these are characteristics of an elder. He should have these characters. Is he perfect in these things? No, obviously not. But these are things that, that he strives for. He, he wants to be blameless. He wants to be tempered. He wants to be hospitable. He doesn't open his house 24-7, but sometimes it seems like 24-7. But he's hospitable. That means he invites people over to enjoy the blessings of the Lord that God has given to them, whether it's for dinner, breakfast, fellowship, or any other things. I know that that's a gift that God has given Virginia and I. Our house is always open to everyone. We've had homeless people sleep there. Uh, we've had people come and, and use facilities there. We've had people come and just use the pool. Uh, we used to, we used to uh, give access to a couple, and not, not that I'm gonna opening this up to anybody, but we used to give access to a couple that, hey, anytime you wanted to go swimming, just go ahead and get in the yard and go swimming, cool off, especially during the summer. And so uh, God has given us that gift. We're not patting ourselves on the back. It's just something that God has given us. It's something that brings joy to, to our hearts. So these are characteristics uh, within that elder. Now, he has to rule his house uh, well. That doesn't mean that his children are not unruly. Uh, because sometimes they are. It means that he's ruling it well and he's disciplining and correcting also. He's not tolerating that unruliness. And as long as they're in his house, they're supposed to behave a certain way. Uh, that was very clear to my boys. I said, this is my house, not your house. And in this house, you behave a certain way. And when you move out, then you can go ahead and behave whatever way you want. But as long as you're here, you know, then you behave yourself. And if you're taking drugs, if you're participating in sin or living a lifestyle sin, you won't live here because that's not what this house is about. As for this house, we shall serve the Lord, uh, Joshua, very clearly. Now, I know some parents, oh, but we got to love our children, have a lot of grace. I agree, but you can have grace, but also be stern in what you believe in order to build that character. And it works. It works. He goes on now, for if a man does not know how to rule his own house, so how will he take care of the house of God? That makes total sense, right? Yeah. I mean, he has to have wisdom to raise children, to take care of his household. There's finances, there's purchasing of items, there's um, you know, no expenditures that you can't overexpend on. You have to budget well. A lot of things that we all do and we all know about as we get grow up to be adults, right? And those are characteristics and qualities that the church looks for in, in men. You know, to be used by God within the church itself. Um, I can only talk, to, talk about myself because I've experienced these things. 
Uh, I remember when I first got my first checkbook and I started writing down all the checks and you know, all the negatives. And I realized, oh, this is not too bad. It's not too hard. And then you get the piece of paper and you write down all the checks and you balance your book out. And it was always right on the dot. And I thought, well, let's teach Virginia how to do this. So I showed her how to do it. And I says, now you keep track of it. And all of a sudden it was a dollar off, $2 off, $50 off, $100 off. And I'm like, it never balances. What's going on here? And, you know, she'd forget to put in an entry or I forget to give her a receipt and she didn't ask for it, you know, just, and finally I said, I have to take that back. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I took it back. But the numbers and the concept got into my head. And so when I came to church, I was able to do that type of stuff, you know, because I learned it while I'm, you know, doing it in my own home. So that's what God is saying here. If he can rule his own home and, and be well there, then he should be able to help in the church itself. Not a novice. So there's time that has to go by. He has to be mature, um, not necessarily mature in age, but that helps because time is always good, but mature in time. And so you could be a person like Greg Laurie who started ministry at age 18, right? And he just gobbled up the word and within a couple of years knew the word and there's some maturity there. There's some growth. Um, I'm sure there wasn't full maturity as a young kid because they think a certain way, but he was mature in the word. He was able to run, run a church with a lot of help. So uh, not a novice, otherwise he's puffed up with pride. He falls into some, in the same condemnation as the devil. And that's, that's always a struggle within church. Um, I know when I was young and started the church, I knew how I wanted it run because I had all this experience with Calvary Chapel. And so sometimes someone would come up and say, hey, uh, let's try this. And no, we're not going to try that. Well, this is how we're going to do it. This is what I've learned. And sometimes it came off like I have my way and it was very prideful and I didn't want to budge from that. And so I get the label of you're rigid. You, you don't change. You're not willing to bend at all. You know, Chuck said, blessed are the flexible because they will not break, you know, and, and they use all the things that I've taught against me, you know, to a certain degree. But there is a certain amount of pride that comes with youth because you don't want to be told what to do. You're a young guy and you know everything, you know, and, and if you are told what to do, that means you don't know what you're doing. And so now you have to admit that you aren't perfect and you don't know everything. But you know what? When you get this old, you go, I know it. I don't know a thing. <laughs> I realize I don't know how to do anything. And I just need the Lord and I need as much help as I possibly can from others because I just don't know how to do certain stuff. No pride at all. Lord, just help me. So, uh, a young novice can become very prideful. Moreover, he must be, or he must have good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and a snare of the devil. So, people outside are those outside the church. So, not that he has fellowship with members outside the church or people outside the church, but that he has a good report. He behaves well with them. And if somebody outside the church, you know, meets them on the street, they, they would shake their hand. They'd have respect towards him. And if they were to introduce him, they would introduce him. This is so-and-so. I can trust him. You know, he's in our community. I know him well. So he has a good, good report within the church. Now he goes on to deacons and pretty much uh, the same kind of characteristics that uh, elders have, except uh, they don't necessarily have to be able to teach. He says, likewise, de deacons must be reverent, uh, not double-tongued. Now, double-tongued is saying a thing twice uh, in sincerity and not doing anything about it. So, yeah, yeah, I'll take care of it. Yeah, 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 I'll take care of it. it never, it's never taken care of. That's double-tongued. So they'll say they're going to take care of it, but there's no intent to take care of it at all. Not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mysteries of the faith with his pure conscience. But let those or let these also first be proved or tested, uh, then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Now, novice, let them be tested. So there's some time that has to go by to prove. I have found, and other pastors that I've spoken to within Calvary Chapel has found that it takes about two years to get to know someone. So we have a policy here that you have to be here six months, and I don't think it's enough, but six months is good enough to get you started and get into ministry, start helping, doing things, so that now we can see if you're faithful, to see if you're going to complete tasks, to see how God is using you, see what gifts you have, and then God will begin to, to move you, and we're going to agree with what God is doing. But it gives us enough time to see you. Two years is a lot of time. But 
I don't know if it's a it's enough time. I think three is more. I think three is better. Two people drop their guards. By two years, they're dropping their guards. They, they start relaxing. Then you really get to know who they are, how they how they speak, what they speak about, and so forth. Because in the beginning, it's like, oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, I'm here. You know, and all of these things. And, and you just kind of like, just, just wait and just listen. And see, after a year, after two years, and their character's proven. Because you can't hold uh, that type of characteristic for long. <laughs> and it seems like every two years. So what happens is, Every two years, you'll see people coming in and out of the church. I don't know, you may have noticed that being a, a seasoned Christians, but you'll notice people coming in and then the same people leaving out within a couple of years. That just seems to be the flow of the body of Christ. Um, they either stick it out and then they start seeing things themselves and say, I don't agree with that, I don't like that, and you know what, it's time to move on. And let's go find another place that maybe will cater to what we want. And that's what Paul calls those Christians that are heaping up teachers for themselves. You know, they have uh, teachers and they want to itch their ears, you know, do what I want you to do, you know, and then I'll be satisfied. Instead of saying, no, I'm going to work through this. We have differences and that's okay. I'll let God work in, in them and what they do, what God's called them to do, and I'll do what God's called me to do. And that's how it should work. So, um, temperate, blameless, proved, um, time. Verse 11, likewise their wives must be reverent not slanders, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house well. For those who, her, who serve well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So the qualifications of an elder and a deacon. Now, why are you looking for men like this? Why are you looking for wives like this? Because there's a building that houses God's people. Look at the next three verses. Verse 14, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, Paul said, but I, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. That's the church. First he says the house of God. Well, what, do you, what, do you, what is Paul talking about the house of God? He's not talking about heaven's house. We can't get there. How do you conduct yourself in the house of God, which is in heaven? We can't. So it must be on earth. What is that? The house of God. It's the building that what? Which is the church. It is the church that meets in the building. That's what he's talking about here. So you need elders, you need deacons, you need leadership, you need pastors to run the church that houses the people of God within that church. So Paul has established here very clearly that the church gathers together as an assembly and meets in a building together. And there's a proper way of conducting yourselves within that building, that piece of property. So <clears throat> when I started a Bible study, we met in our home. And it was a Bible study. It wasn't church but it was the body of Christ meeting together to see what God would do. And we started a Bible study and we met and we taught the word and we did things similar to this, but not to the extent because we were limited and we had kids in the, clo in, in the closet. We had kids in the garage. We put carpet out there. We had classrooms there. We had kids in the bedrooms. We had kids outside. You know, we had everything tried to set up as good as we could to minister to people. And then it grew. And we were like, okay, now what do we do? Well, we need a place to meet. And I found this place right here. It was vacant. It was trashed. And I got a hold of the owner and said, we'd like to lease your property. And he gave us a lease for about $1,000 a month. And so we leased it. And we started cleaning it up. The church started cleaning the building that they were going to meet in. And 2008, the market crashed. And all of a sudden now we own the building. And God has been so faithful to bless us with this building. We have pretty much remodeled the whole church. Need a couple of bathrooms in my office and we are done on the inside. This is the building that houses God's people. And we meet here 
to study the Word of God on Wednesday nights. We meet here on Sunday mornings to study the Word of God. We meet here on Sunday nights to have events like we did this Sunday, fellowship and a virtual reality of the life of Jesus. It houses the people of God to fellowship, to do a work. We meet here to have concerts like this October when we're gonna reach out to the community on their Halloween and on our Harvest Festival. And we're gonna invite them and hopefully they'll get saved as many do sometimes. And so we take the opportunity to use this as an opportunity to reach the world. So again, Paul is very clear. How do you conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church, Iglesia, the assembly that gathers together in the building of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. What is the pillar and ground of the truth? The household of God. This is where the truth, this is where we're grounded. This is where we grow. How does a church function? Well, God raises up a man. Now, this is within Calvary Chapel, so not all churches function this way. You have denominations, you have non-denominationals, you have um, uh, what you would call or call um, church members that run the church along with the pastor. So they have voting power. If they become a member, they sign a document, and they pretty much are, as they sign that document, they sign to give 10% of their income, and it's automatically withdrawn, withdrew from there and into the place. So that gives them the voting rights uh, to, to that membership. <clears throat> um, they also are agreeing to the tenets of their faith and so forth and things like that. Um, then there are those that are what they call elder run, where there's maybe two or three or four elders that run the church. There's no one senior pastor. One might have the gift of teaching, one might have a gift of administration, one might have other gifts, and they interchange with each other. Sometimes one elder will teach a, through a message, a series, then the next one will come along, give him time to study and prepare you know, a good message. And if you give one of those guys, and I, I kind of like it because one of those guys could have you know, a whole month off, but he's preparing a series and really getting deep and setting it up so it's really profound. So when you hear these guys, it's because they had months of doing this, you know? Uh, uh, and pre preparation, where in Calvary, it's usually the pastor. Uh, we believe the model of Moses is more biblical than anything else. And so you have God calling Moses, Moses then leads the people. And so as the pastor of the church, he's the one that guides the people as God is directing him. Then he calls alongside himself assistant pastors, guys that will help him run the ministry, that will do administration, will do counseling, hospital visits and all of these things that the senior pastor is doing in the beginning. Deacons to help with setting up the church, finances and so forth. So he begins to order the church in such a way so that it functions greatly and in order. And then the people come in and they support the church by giving of their tithes, not because they signed a piece of paper, but because they know the word of God, because they've been taught the word of God, they love God. And so they're going to commit themselves to God only, not to the pastor, but to God. All of us together commit ourselves to God and what we find in scriptures to be true. That is how the church is to function. Now, as far as the function of the church and its normal today things, this is true. As far as events and so forth and uh, counseling and marriages and all of these things, again, it all flows through the assistant pastors, the elders, and then the pastor. Uh, as far as discipline, the church understands that they're submitted to the pastor of that church that God has called them to. Like with Moses, the people were to submit under to him. And then you had people like Korah, you know, who decided, no, I don't need to submit to Moses. Who does he think he is, you know? Uh, God's blessed us with the gift of prophecy too. And so God showed him, no, I've chosen Moses to play this role. You have a role, you play it. And we saw that with Miriam and and Aaron too, the same thing. So we all have to play our roles. Uh, the church is the church that sits there and listens to the pastor teach the word. They are to approach that as though God were speaking to them. They're to be able to discern when it is his opinion or when it is the truth. And I don't have any issue with that at all. I hope you're seeking the truth. And so as you're seeking the truth, you say he's right on there. That's his opinion. You might disagree, and that's fine. We can disagree agreeably. And you go your merry way, and you live your household the way you want to live it. Now, we're not here to control any of those issues, and I don't want to. In fact, you'll find oftentimes that if you come to me and you say, hey, I got this situation, what do you think I should do? And I would say, well, what would you do? And I put it back on them. 
And then I would listen to their decision or, or, or ideas, and I'd say, I think that sounds pretty good, and I'd go for it. Because they need encouragement and confidence to say, I'm able to do this too. They, they don't need someone to go to and just get all the answers and then go apply it. And then when it doesn't work, they go, oh, that's his fault. You know, no, no, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> I used to do it, but not anymore. I don't, I don't like doing that. I like them to seek God, pray about it, seek God, seek his word, uh, wait for the Lord to speak to you, and then, you know, make your decision. But if you ask me what I would do, like if you came to me and said, how would you handle this? Then I would say this. If it was me and this was happening in my house, this is what I would do. I'm not saying this is what you should do, but this is what I would do. And I handle it that way. Then they can take that back, and if they want to apply it, that's fine. But if not, you know, I, w I didn't say this is what you should do. No, this is what I did. And so uh, Pastor Chuck was really good at that. Um, and I've never asked him questions, but I've heard it from, from some of the pastors that they would go up to Chuck and say, hey, Chuck, I got this situation, and I did so and so and so, blah, 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 blah. And, and so what do you think? And Chuck goes, sounds good to me. And he'd always do that. But if they went up to him and said, hey, Pastor Chuck, this situation here, what would you do in it? He goes, oh, well, this is what I would do. You know, and then he'd give them his advice. But if you came to him and, and you, you know, told him what you did and blah, 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 he would just agree with you and figure you're being led by the Spirit, so do it. You know, the Spirit's going to lead you. And if it's the wrong thing to do, oh, well. I heard a funny thing the other day that, um, uh, <laughs> that this guy who got saved was, uh, he, he had some anger issues and um, he wanted to see his family saved so much. And so he was witnessing to his his families, and um, he says, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to beat you up, you know, and the family's like, oh, and it started to I mean, argue with him, and he's trying to share the gospel, finally he started beating him up, and so the, pa uh, the pastor didn't know what to do, he goes, you can't beat people up because they're not receiving Jesus, why not, why not, they need the Lord, <laughs> and so um, I think they were like instigating him, and so he said, if you don't stop it, I'm going to beat you up, so someone came to Chuck and said, and said to Chuck, Chuck, these guys are getting beat up by this guy who says he's a Christian, and they keep instigating him. And Chuck says, well, then they better learn not to instigate him. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. You know? I mean, it made sense, right? <laughs> Don't instigate him. He won't beat you up. So these are things that happen in the house. Now, make it very clear. God doesn't want you sitting at home watching Facebook or Instagram or all those other YouTubes and all that stuff and thinking, I'm having church. You're not having church. The Bible says you're not having church. No, it's in the building. Gather together, functioning together. Um, and it's interesting because people will go, God hasn't called me to serve in the church. Yes, he has. You are not reading your Bible. I had someone say this to me years ago. Uh, said, you're always talking about service, service, service. I'm too busy at home. I got too much going on. I can't be serving in the church either. I go, okay, that's fine. So it still bugged them because I'd always talk about service, service, service. And you know uh, service is always an issue because it comes up. And I remember afterwards they, they came to me and says, you know, you were always talking about that and I told you I'm too busy. And so I decided to ask some other pastors. And so that's what they did. They asked other pastors and there's one pastor that they're related to and they asked him and they said, well, as hard as it is, it's what the Bible teaches. And they were just like, wow, okay. So everybody's agreeing with him. So they ended up serving, you know, uh, because they knew it was the right thing to do. They searched it out, they, they prayed about it, and they realized it's what the Bible teaches. God wants us all serving. People leave here, you know, especially small churches, because small churches need servants. We're always in this. So do big churches, but you just don't know it. Big churches have big crowds to draw from, so you can hide. And people have left here to go hide in bigger churches. It's just easier because I don't have to hear this come help us serve, uh, this and that. I can just go in, listen to the message, and then leave and do my thing, you know, do live my way. And that's religion. That is really religion. That is your church that you have created outside of the Bible, and that's how you want to live. You've created this little idol that in my, in, in my faith in Jesus Christ, I don't serve. I just go to be served through the word of God, and I'll give my tithe, but that's about it. Um, I need to leave because I have a whole life out there that I want to continue on. And that's not tr true church. True church is serving. You saw it in Acts chapter 2 very clearly. The very beginning, they came together and they served. So 
This is how the church is to function. He closes up and says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. That's the gospel in a nutshell, right? Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that your truth would go out, Father. Everything that I said was from me would just fall to the wayside. And Lord, that your word would go out and it would go out very clearly to them by your spirit, Lord, that they would see that they need to be in church and serving in some capacity, Father. This is your kingdom and the things that you want us to do are very clear, really clearly written in your word, Lord. And we must seek those things out, Father. I pray your blessings, your love, and your grace be upon your people today as you lead them throughout the day, Father. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you on Wednesday at 9 a.m.